Hello and uh, welcome as we come this time to the sixth Sunday uh, weekend of Easter. So the Easter season is moving along quite too quickly. And in fact, uh, this coming Thursday will be the 40th day since the celebration of Easter. Of course, uh, Ascension Day uh, observed here in our neck of the woods in the east, northeastern part of our country. We keep Ascension Day as the day of remembering Jesus that is being raised up uh, into the glory of, of the Father. In other parts of the country, just so that you know, uh, the Feast of the Ascension is often transferred to this, to the next Sunday. Be that as it may, um, <clears throat> the readings for uh, this time first come from the book of the Acts, chapter 8, verses 5 through 8, and verses 14 through 17. Second reading continues the section from the letter, first letter of Peter, chapter 3, verses 15 through 18. And the gospel brings us once again to John, this time to chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. Now, I'd like to begin by looking a little bit at the story of Acts. As you may know, and as we have mentioned frequently, the opening eight chapters of the book of Acts, which is attributed to the author of the third gospel, namely Luke, presents the story of the development of the Christian experience in the city of Jerusalem. So the first eight chapters, almost all of the material happens within Jerusalem. And in fact, as we will see when we come to the Feast of the Ascension, and in fact, to our reflection next weekend, we'll be once again going to the beginning of the book of Acts. This time, chapter 8 follows the uh, c conclusion of events that have taken place uh, not without some resistance on the part of those who are in charge of running the city of Jerusalem, but nevertheless a successful time for the development of the Christian experience. And as Luke presents it, all things are centered around the 12, around the apostles. That's how the early uh, community is developed. Not that they lord it over, but rather that all things kind of revolve around them. <clears throat> Preceding the uh, chapter that, verses that we will hear this time, is the decision on the part, we've seen this before, of the apostles in choosing seven men to serve the needs of the widows, particularly uh, the Hellenistic widows, but also to serve the needs of the community. And two of them are named <clears throat> specifically with information about them. All seven are named, but only two do we know something about. The first would be Stephen. <clears throat> and what we uh, have not really heard as we've looked at the material found in the book of Acts is the martyrdom of Stephen. Stephen had begun by um, preaching, teaching the good news of Jesus. In fact, he had given a wonderful uh, homily uh, in, in indicating the importance of Jesus. <clears throat> and that had resulted particularly when he had seen a vision and said that he saw Jesus present, had led a group to not only uh, be objecting to him, arguing with him, but also had led him outside the city and, well, or at least had stoned him. And so the martyrdom of um, Stephen, and they had, remember, laid their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. So by that action, the indication was that Saul had approved of what they were doing. Now, this death of um, Stephen causes many to leave Jerusalem, to go, and this is the story of how the message now will um, take place from the center and begin to move specifically the uh, writer of Acts mentions into Judea and Samaria. 
And it's with that uh, in, in mind, keep in mind that the apostles stay within the city of uh, Jerusalem. Interestingly, they are not pictured at this point as moving out of Jerusalem. It's important we'll see in a moment why I, I uh, mention this. The man whom we received some information about this time is Philip. <clears throat> Now this is not <clears throat> Philip, one of the apostles, but this is another Philip, namely one of the seven who had been chosen to be uh, servants or servers for the sake of those in need. Now, in the Lucan ideology or in the, in the Lucan gospel, which is reflected as we see here in the Acts, Communion with the apostles always remains paramount. And this is what binds the community together. So Philip goes now down into the territory of the Samaritans. By the way, just we will hear that as uh, fellow believers in Jesus leave the city of Jerusalem, Paul <clears throat> begins a mission of trying to seek out those who were believers, hence the word persecutes, per, uh, believers in the message of Jesus. This is the beginning, really, of his story, which will predominate in much of the Acts of the Apostles later on as the um, work unfolds. So all of that, again, material that we will hear, um, kind of to put it into perspective. Now, Philip is pictured as going among the Samaritans. We have heard of the Samaritans many times, of course, in our discussion. Important to remember that the Samaritans are not Gentiles. Um, in fact, the Samaritans had claimed, in fact, to be the ancient and more traditional form of the religion of Israel. This had gone back to the time when the Northern Kingdom had fallen under the armor, armor, <clears throat> arms of the uh, Assyrians, and the Samaritans, um, at least some of them, claimed that they remained loyal to the place of Israel. Yes, there had been some intermarriage, but they were uh, basically always had their roots in Judaism. And in fact, the argument by the time that this work of the Acts is being written or considered, the Judeans, that is those Jews who lived in the south of Israel, were considered by the, uh, the Samaritans as interlopers and innovators. In fact, the Samaritans considered the Judeans to be the lost sheep. They were the ones who had not remained and stayed faithful to the tradition of Israel. So clearly there is a tension, or was a tension, between the Samaritans and the Judeans and among many of the other Jews, as we have mentioned and seen on a number of other occasions. It is Philip who now goes among the Samaritans and begins to tell the story of Jesus and makes what we would today, I suppose, call converts or brings some of the Samaritans into the uh, faith family of the Christian believers. Now, when word, and this is how the little episode that we're looking at takes place, when word meets um, the, the apostles up in Jerusalem, it's important to notice that they give affirmation to what has happened through the ministry of Philip. And so, as we hear, um, although Philip has baptized in the name of Jesus, interestingly, but they have not received the Spirit, it is now at this point that Peter and John, two of the apostles still up in Jerusalem, go down and bestow the Spirit upon the Samaritans. Confor uh, confirming them in communion with Jerusalem. Interestingly, this coming of the spir a Spirit, which of course we will remember more form formally when we look at the opening of this book, but now the Spirit comes upon those 
who have joined the Christian family through the ministry of Philip. So all of that um, affirms the apostles as because they are the official witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus and the coming of the Spirit upon those converts whom Philip has made. What has been left out here, and let me just fill this in, in this little section, is that there was a man named um, Simon. Now, Simon was, uh, and you can find this in verses 9 to 13. So you notice that we left out a couple of verses here in the readings. Well, that's why, because the story of Simon is left out, was a man who practiced magic in Samaria. Um, now, uh, be careful here about magic or the understanding of magic. When we think of it, of course, we think of it as sleights of hand, kind of tricks by which uh, magicians, hence the word there, um, kind of does or creates uh, interesting uh, circumstances. But I do mention, just as an aside, that magic in the ancient world was not necessarily seen as sleights of hand or magic tricks. Magic was a kind of way of appreciating the beauty of what God was doing. Now, there are other traditions, not Jewish and not Christian, that saw the magician really as the kind of spiritual leader of the community. So this is not the place where we will go into a long discussion of that, but I do just want to uh, mention that there's a deeper sense of what magic involves. Sometimes the magician could also perform uh, healing uh, ministries, such as we find the apostles, Philip or James and John, Phil, uh, Peter being able uh, to do. Now. What we hear in the Acts is that Simon becomes baptized. He becomes a Christian. But when the apostles come, um, he would like to have the same power, the same gift of the Spirit that the apostles has, have. And in fact, he offers money in order to receive this gift. Peter is pictured as saying, and again, these are uh, found in verse 18, says to Simon, may your silver perish with you. Repent this, your evil deeds. To think that you can buy the healing gifts of God with money is uh, uh, certainly a mistake. Simon says to Peter then, pray for me to the Lord. So um, what will emerge from here as um, a side effect Notice his name is Simon, emerges a practice which is known as simony, S-I-M-O-N-Y, namely attempting to purchase a sacred offer, office or power by money. So um, that's just a little aside. It's certainly contained in the material found in chapter uh, eight here, but I thought uh, just we have uh, kind of to flesh out the conclusion of the eight chapters here of the uh, Jerusalem ministry. So Philip, we've seen, uh, drove out unclean spirits. Keep in mind, too, that Luke has in mind not only the spreading of the faith, but even a geographical, um, or ge yeah, geographical, having to do with geography, uh, expansion. So territory, and, and it's interesting the way in which this is thought that the territory which was not believing in Jesus was considered to be in the power of the demons. So as the message of the faith spreads, um, literally um, power is being wrestled from the demons and brought under God's rule. So. Um, uh, the conclusion of all of this little uh, section here is that power for goodness was a gift from God. It could not be purchased, but it was important, and it became part and parcel of the life of those who were believers in Jesus and in the Christian way. So um, 
this continuing story, we don't know much more about Simon, although just as an aside, a number of uh, writers and even motion pictures uh, in the 50s and 60s picked up on Simon and uh, kind of made a story about him. All of that, by the way, is theatrical, is not found in any of the scriptural tradition. And even though um, some saw him as the center of a new cult or um, found him as the founder of Gnosticism. Now, we've spoke about that before. And once again, these would all be adjuncts to the figure of Simon that really uh, do not have any historical basis, but are much more literary and uh, fictional in their development. But I mention all this because you may have heard of this or seen something of this. So all of that is the uh, story found in Acts 8 of uh, this time for our reading. But the emphasis, again, I think, is on the coming of uh, Peter and John and conferring the Spirit that is, the Holy Spirit, on these um, new converts to the Christian way. Moving now to the Gospel, which again is chapter 14 of John's Gospel, concludes what we heard last week. You remember last week that Jesus had said to um, Philip Thomas, when Jesus had said, "Where I, I'm going away, would I come back to you? You will know the way. And Thomas had said, well, we don't know the way. And Jesus had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This had been followed by Philip. Now, this is not the same Philip as uh, in Acts. So it's interesting that uh, the, the two different men's uh, kind of stories are brought to our reflection this time. Philip says to Jesus, show us the Father and that will be enough. And Jesus says to Philip, have I been with you so long a time that you do not see in me the Father, that I do the works of the Father. And so therefore, if you reflect on me, you will see the Father. So chapters um, verses, rather, 16 through 20, which now are included, remember we're looking at 15 through 21, contains three basic ideas, which also are repeated in parallelism. First is, the Spirit is coming, that Jesus, who is going away, will re be returning. Now, what we're not sure here is how this coming or returning of Jesus was to be understood. Was it to be understood as after three days, Jesus had been crucified, he had risen, been raised from the dead, and now came back to his disciples? Is this the coming that the writer has in mind? Or is he looking at Jesus' return in what we would call a more eschatological way, that at a, a, a later time in history or a later purpose in time, would be coming again. So that's the first idea that's developed here. The second is that the forces of evil neither see nor know the spirit. Only those who accept the teaching of Jesus truly understand the gift and power of the Holy Spirit. And the third idea developed here is that the disciples know the spirit because he abides with and in them. And this, of course, is, uh, goes back to understandings that we saw again last time. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. Dwelling, of course, is not simply a physical building, but also has to do with a presence. Now, in the Gospel of John, there is, uh, we have spoken of this before, and uh, keep in mind that the readings are chosen because we're going to be moving forward to the coming in the formal way of the, of the Spirit, that in the Gospel of John, <clears throat> family relationships are important, and he uses words to strengthen that relationship like abiding, like dwelling, like remaining. These are all ways in which the presence of Jesus 
can and would be experienced. The disciples, um, as we have seen, are Jesus' accredited representatives. So when they make a petition in his name, it is, in fact, Jesus who is at work because they officially are able to ask, ask for and seek things in his name. And so they can be confident, that is, the disciples, that he will hear them and carry them out. By the way, just as an aside, when we think that Jesus comes among the disciples, in John, the disciples, the word disciples, are those who believe in Jesus or who have worked with Jesus, are not limited to the apostles. When, and uh, we mentioned a little bit that Luke, uh, early on as we pointed out in the Acts, sees the apostles and separates them from disciples. But when Jesus comes among the disciples, there may be more than the apostles there. That's an interesting thought, just backtracking a moment here, that even when uh, at the Last Supper, Jesus is pictured as having the supper with his disciples, could it be that if this truly were a Passover, that there were other members there, women perhaps, and even children? Um, and there are some pictures that have developed in more recent times that suggest that understanding of disciples needs to be a little bit more um, expanded than limited as to kind of history uh, male interpreters have uh, placed that. It's not to say that the apostles weren't there, but it's to say that they weren't the only ones there. That's an aside a little bit from the material we're looking at, but just as uh, kind of something to consider as we're looking at the richness of the uh, writings of the uh, four Gospels, particularly that of the foreign, uh, fourth Gospel. Now, in this story that we hear this time, Jesus reiterates his commandment, namely that for the family to develop, for the relationship to be strengthened, specifically what are needed or is needed are faith and love. Faith is the gateway, but love is that which binds together, which blends together, and which leads to a true expression of being a believer of Jesus. At this point in the discussion that Jesus is making, he makes the reference that he will send another paraclete. And so this opens the, the door to our reflection on the Holy Spirit. Now, a paraclete technically would be a guide, sometimes is thought as a comfort, sometimes seen as a strength. But technically, an a, a paraclete was an advocate. That is, someone that you would want to stand beside you when you are in a difficult situation whether it might be under persecution, or at a loss for what to say, or as needing a defense. So uh, that's really what a paraclete was to, uh, to be. Not, now, it's fair enough to say he can be a counselor, he can be a comforter, he can be a strengthener, and you can see how those things might truly uh, uh, work in here. But uh, technically, this reference to the paraclete was, and it was not own, known not only in Judaism, but also in other uh, parts of the Roman world as an advocate, someone who would stand by you. I'm not sure in our legal system today that's exactly what your lawyer does, but he uh, is intended, I believe, to kind of defend uh, the defendant um, against whatever charges they, they might be. So, when Jesus says, I will send another paraclete, now, another would indicate, would, if we back up a moment, that Jesus is a paraclete. 
Jesus is one who is going to stand with those who are professing their belief in him and are willing to endure and engage in the ministry of the kingdom. So the paraclete, therefore, um, this other paraclete, another paraclete, keep in mind, would be a person of some standing in society, by the way. I mean, you don't just go and pick any Tom, Dick, and Harry, no expression, Tom, Dick, and Harry to be your, your paraclete. It would be someone who society or the community would recognize as a noble and a true witness to the truth of what you were uh, saying or the information that you were passing on. So in that sense, a paraclete certainly um, would be one, see what I'm saying here, is would be respected by and recognized by the larger community. So uh, in this case, of course, Jesus as the paraclete would be recognized, uh, certainly by believers, as uh, very important. So Jesus is now in the process of forming, and this is where the kind of intention this time is, um, another who will stand with the Christians, the believer, and this paraclete will be a spirit of truth. Now this is very important. Uh, Jesus is pictured as saying, I will not leave you as orphans. Keep in mind we're talking here about familial uh, connections, relationships. Orphans, of course, did not have um, an appropriate relationship with a, a family, a loss of a parent, um, however that might have happened. So Jesus pictures, when I send this new advocate, this new paraclete, I will not let you as uh, orphans, but I will give you the supports and helps that, that you need. So um, as we hear these words uh, this time, Jesus is pictured once again, keep in mind these words are given at the time of the Last Supper. Um, Jesus is uh, uh, telling his disciples or warning them that he will not be with them as they are regularly uh, seeing him. But as I mentioned, um, he will, in a little while he's going away, but in a little while um, he will be coming again. So we're not uh, quite sure what this coming again of the Lord is. Certainly in our tradition, we tend to think of the Lord as coming again um, in a future time. What, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, in what we call an eschatological time, at a time when the ending of things will take place and an important and wonderful new beginning will um, occur. This advocate of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and we will hear more about this as we um, go on. Important, the commandment that Jesus illustrates and indicates um, as in the reading that we listen to is one who will keep my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. So there is this uh, very important uh, understanding frequently that we hear in the tradition about loving, but it is not the passionate loving or more, more romantic loving that a spouse might have for a spouse. Certainly that's beautiful, but the love here is what in some ways we would call a tough love, a love that will stand against uh, times of difficulty, of struggle, of suffering, of persecution. Jesus is uh, comforting but also challenging uh, his believers, that would be us, that sometimes <clears throat> Following in the way of Jesus is not always going to be so easy and uh, uh, secure. Well, secure it is, but easy it is not. May that true love of God, that commandment to love God, which the spirit of Jesus encourages and strengthens, be ours once again this time. Thank you for being with us. Hope to see you again.